Uh, welcome to the house, man. Thank you very much. It's fun to see you again yeah. and be with you. It's good to be with and you. And to be in your home. Well, it's yes, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Now, do you publicize your address? No, no. I mean, okay. I actually have my address listed online as the uh, a place in the Bronx, which is the birthplace of hip hop. So that's what everybody thinks. It's 1520 Central Avenue. I love Avenue. it. I didn't realize you had to do with the origin of hip hop. Yeah, no, you were an early uh, DJ. I was, yeah, I was four when it happened. Playing at parties, <laughs> block parties in the Bronx. <laughs> that's right. You know, cool Herc, God. you came up with him? I met him once. No once. kidding, yeah. yeah, that's pretty good. It's, uh, you know, we all have our tentacles everywhere, us Canadians. Um, I was just, th well, think about your history, you know, back in the early days, we talked about this on the phone, and I had, at least Scratch Perry was in this house not that long ago, and we were talking about Jackie Me Too, and it was like, right, Paul played with that guy. Like, where you would have known him. Jackie Me Too, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, I was, I was surprised that when you brought him up the last yeah. time we were talking over the phone. Because I think a lot of times, you know, for obvious reasons, they see you on TV every day, they think Paul's the guy in this show, but people don't realize maybe the history that you have with music. It is true that people want to categorize you, and if we take a look at a guy from history, Doc Severinsen, yeah. people don't, I mean, a long time ago, but he was the great band leader for yeah. Johnny Carson right. all those years, and a hell of a trumpet player, yeah. a guy who, he's in his 90s now, but still playing, still warms up two hours, before he'll even walk on the stage, you know, and he was underrated for that reason, because he was funny too, you know, mm -hmm. and he could talk to Johnny Carson, compete with him and stuff, and I guess they just automatically said, well, he couldn't really be able to play the trumpet as well, but, right. but, but he could. Mm -hmm. And yes, music's still number one for me, and yeah. even though I'm not working uh, as hard as I used to, there are still people who will let me play the piano. And I was, you know, and I, that's, come down to now uh, what's truly important. That's right, well there's a piano here for you if you want. Well, all right. Um, the, you were really young when you started taking lessons, right? But was it watching the- I would the say so, six years old, I yeah. think. And is it the, like, what were you listening to? Thunder Bay at that time, what, what was the radio? I mean, I know Ed Sullivan was big, but what else were you, how were you well, finding? Well, of course, uh, uh, we had three stations, uh, and uh, two of them became rock and roll stations. Yeah. Um, and of course I was listening to them, <clears throat> but after dark up there in Thunder Bay, you could receive American radio, or uh, the big 50,000 watts of yeah. uh, WLS Chicago AM radio. I used to tune in. Wow. We used to get the Buffalo ones in KB and it was amazing to listen to them, but only at night. Yes, yeah. at night, yeah. And then I could also hear a, a station called KAAY, Little Rock, Arkansas, that had soul music all after midnight, all night long. And it was like I had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> so like that the... was a lifeline, listening to American radio. Right. And especially the R&B and soul. That's what I loved uh, as a kid. When I got to Toronto, mm -hmm. I found that there, it was a soul town. Uh, back, I'm talking about 60s, you know, late 60s. Yeah. Some reason every band was an R&B band and they would do white guys doing James Brown's act and. Yeah other white guys doing Sam and Dave's act and stuff like that. And, and the organ, the Hammond organ was the basis of all of right. these bands. The B3? Yeah, that B3. And I, I don't know, I, I gravitated. Well, even before I heard them, somehow I gravitated to that, that organ. I don't know why. Yeah, that just had a really, it sounded so fresh. I mean, when I heard it a bit later, it still sounded fresh. I mean, imagine that at the time, it would have blown your mind. The real Hammond organ had something called a tone wheel. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, but it gave it almost a human, yeah. throaty quality to it. Right. And also, you press the key, you know, on a piano, it, you press one note, it decays. An organ never decays until you pick up your hand. Right. You know, all of this fascinated me, and of course, those draw bars. That, you know, uh, to, to me, that's the whole universe in there. Right. What's going on with the drawbars? So move a little of them, you know, changes the whole picture. And piano. when you're overdubbing on top of a record, you can sort of tune the sound in, depending on what's missing. You know, oh, well, we need, you know, no, nothing in the really high frequency. Okay, I'll bring in some highs, you know. Right. And you learn how to do all these cool things on the organ, which was the first synthesizer. It's interesting, you know, the idea that, that a note didn't decay, so in a way, piano is kind of like life. You know, you hit it, 
you hope to have a nice sustain and then it goes, but an organ is kind of like a musical gift of afterlife. It could be anything you want it to be for as long as you want it to be. Did you plan to say this? No, no, I was just, just thinking coming about that. up with it now. Yeah, well, yeah. You are a philosopher. No, <laughs> well, that's what you were saying. You're I the kind think. of guy who would get on a motorcycle and drive all the way to Los Angeles. <laughs> Which I understand you're going to do. I certainly would. I certainly man, would. man, I won't be going. I won't be with you on that trip. I'll get a sidecar. But for Danny Aykroyd, of course, yeah. he would be right there. Oh, he's coming to the house next week. Daniel cool. Lear. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell him about the uh, the trip. He may take it with you. He was cool. always driving down from Canada to New York on the bike. It's a freedom. It's a lifeline for us, I think. Yeah, I idea. think for maybe the first time he came down, you know, to to meet the original Sunday Night Live people, he arrived on his bike. Amazing. Yeah. It's that freedom. Yeah, I can imagine. When did you get a sense that you could do this, like you were good at this, and it was more than just a kid who was playing piano because his parents got him lessons? Well, I don't know. You know, I loved it so much, and uh, although I took piano lessons, I, I didn't really um, practice my lesson, but once I heard rock and roll, I would spend a couple of hours every day after school, sit down at the piano and learn, you know, whatever rock tunes. And I didn't buy records as a kid. I would just learn them yeah. by ear and just play them and immerse myself. Yeah, then I'd play them as hard as I could and get the sound up all around my ears. And that was my fun as a kid. Right. But I never uh, was going to go into music too far-fetched. Right. A kid from Thunder Bay, you know, forget it. Right. And Amer a Canadian, God bless us all, you know, and we're so polite and we get kidded. Mm -hmm. But we're also a little bit pessimistic, I think, yeah. about our own. Who do you think you are, eh? You know? There's you, a lot of that, isn't there? Yeah, what, what do you think you're going to be... <laughs> You know, you big shot, eh? Yeah. So, no, I came down to Toronto, and I went to University of Toronto, and I, I graduated with a degree in sociology. Mm -hmm. On a different career path altogether. I didn't know what I was going to do, but certainly not music. Right. And then you're uh, playing in strip bars, is that true? You playing... Of course, of yeah. course. Go-go bars. <laughs> At that time, there was live music. Well, I'm talking about now when I got out of school, because yeah. during school, I was so depressed. At least first year, you know, I'd given up. I had no more rock band to play in, and I was going to try to settle down and become an academic, and I just wasn't working, and I was exhausted all the time from depression. If I had a 9 o'clock class, I'd come back at 10, go right back to bed. That's uh, serious. I couldn't, yes. I could. Nowadays, I'd say, oh, you have Epstein bars. I was just depressed. And then I started playing a little bit, uh, cosmic jazz, uh, on the side in second year, at U of T, and I cheered up, and it was clear, I have to, I have to at least try this. Right. Uh, so it's not really, I thought I was, I was great, I could make, just, I, I had no alternative. I wasn't going to be happy unless, you know, unless this worked. Or I, I, I made a deal, a classic deal with my parents, said, give me a year, let me try show business for a year. Right. If I'm starving, I'll go back to school. I don't know, maybe I'd go to grad school, or my dad was a lawyer, of course, and he would have loved me to I'd go into the law, but it, just, it didn't appeal to me. So what were those, when you would go back to, back to your bed at 10 o'clock, yeah. that's a pretty dark time. Yeah. What were you thinking? What were you feeling? I didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, just, uh, this is not so much fun. Um, I didn't know what to do. Right. Um, I did know that I wanted to stay in Toronto, though. Yeah. There was not only more action here, but you could see world-class entertainment here. Up in Thunder Bay, uh, Liberace came once, I saw him. That's amazing. The Beach Boys. Yeah. Uh, that was about it, as far as, you know, international... Uh, Liberace, that could explain your fascination with great glasses. And he had a second pianist, and that was it, you know, yeah. to accompany him, and he was playing piano. He was fantastic. He, uh, another underrated guy, you know, he yeah. really had some chops. Yeah, for sure. Liberace, he could play the piano. <laughs> nobody, nobody agrees, but he could really play the piano. And he was very sweet to me, too. Yeah, and you when met When I finally met him, he came on, on Letterman. I remember he came on Letterman the same time as Bob, the same show as Bob Dylan, what? first appearance on Letterman. This would have been in the 80s. And I'm saying at the beginning, I'm so excited. Liberace is going to cook. I think he cooked, you know. I said, of course, he all, always cooks yeah. musically. And then I said, and Bob Dylan, I said, Dave, did you know he went electric? I, <laughs> this was in the about 86. And, Dylan, and Dave was like, no, I didn't know that, Paul. Yeah. I didn't know that. 
Uh, you also, I know that you, when you were a kid listening to those radio stations, especially the American ones, Ray Charles would have been a big part. And then you got to connect with Ray, was it early? Was it SNL? Yes, it was. Well, you know, my dad, uh, as, as conservative a lawyer as he was, he had very hip musical tastes and he loved jazz and the great jazz singers and he loved Ray Charles. My dad turned me on to Ray Charles. Uh, but it didn't take me long to realize yeah. he knew what he was talking about and this was the epitome of soul. And yes, there he was as a host of Saturday Night Live. Maybe it was 77, I can't exactly remember the, the year, but I found myself playing behind him because he brought his own original five horns from the original quintet that he had, five horned the thing, with the great uh, uh, Dave Fathead Newman and uh, all the great people, uh, Hank, uh, Hank uh, Crawford, uh, great jazz players. And then he did a couple of tunes with the house band, including one, Oh, What a Beautiful Morning. Uh, the old fashioned tune, jazz waltz style. Oh, what a beautiful, oh, oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, and my job was supposed to be to play soul licks behind him right. in that first uh, verse, Dude, especially. What a trip that was. And be. I'm sweating bullets <laughs> because this is Ray Charles. And it's free, you know, back him up, play yeah. behind him. And of course, I was trembling in my boots. And in the rehearsal, he stopped the whole band. And he said, organ, call me organ. He said, organ, play with some soul. Well, I'm just dying, you know, this Canadian kid. Play with some soul. I said, I know I got soul, but I couldn't, you, couldn't get you know. And, and God bless him, Howard Johnson, who was the original baritone sax and tuba player on that SNL live band. Mm -hmm. Very well known, had played the band last wall show and yeah. had, played with Taj Mahal, all tuba band and stuff. And he was our, our contractor too. Anyway, time stood still and he says, play it with some song, I didn't know what to do. And Howard Johnson, a, a lovely African-American friend of mine, sp spoke up and said, he's got it, Ray, count it off again. He, he's got it, don't worry. And Ray reluctantly counted it off again. And this time I just, I had to go, I just went for it. Oh, what a beautiful world. Ray says, you know, that's more like it. And yeah. I'm telling you, it was vindication and... Uh, what a trip. I, I've never experienced any such pressure and then such, such vindication. But also a great moment of friendship where, a, where, a, where someone has your back. Well, that's absolutely true. Howard and I are still great friends. You read a lot about how the, from the performers on SNL, how for the comedians it was hell for a lot of them because it felt like they were in there alone and there was so much anxiety, but those bands took care of each other? Is that what it was like? Oh, well, that's nice to say. You know what? The, the rep company took, uh, took care of each other, too. Yeah. Sure, there was competition for airtime, mm -hmm. but uh, those people were very close, and those of us still living continue to be close. Right. Uh, Danny, Aykroyd, and I are very close friends. Uh, one of the worst things of my professional life was when I was working with Gilda Radner, uh, on what eventually became her Broadway one-woman show, but initially it was gonna be an album. Yeah. I was co-producing it with a friend of mine. We didn't get it done on time. We had to pull, I had to pull out of the Blues Brothers movie right. at the very last well, second. I heard Belushi wrote a, even wrote a note about you saying, Paul. I don't know what it was because <laughs> there was no Twitter at the time, but somehow it was like a press release yeah. came. Schaefer is out. He will never be a Blues Brother. Oh my goodness, we had a big feud. But then Danny brought us together and we had a big really? reconciliation and I rejoined for the tour in 1980 and then Danny made sure that I was in the sequel. Right, yeah. Uh, Blues Brothers 2000. That's right. And I got to work with Aretha and all those people. I was sitting there watching that movie saying, man, I could, that could have been me. That right. But Danny made it all and so okay. Who, who so took, talk about a good friend. Sure, who took your place in Blues Brothers? Well, uh, if I may modestly say, I think they had, took three guys. They had to, <laughs> because I would have done, you know, other, I had some lines, so yeah. there was a guy to do the lines. Right. There was a guy to be the MD, a musical director of it, and then mm -hmm. another guy to play the piano. So all, all these three different guys. But a yeah. lovely guy named Murphy Dunn actually played the yeah. role in, in the movie. Right. And still apparently does play with them. But the, Danny graciously lets the, some of the members of the band that we put together mm -hmm. continue to work as the Blues Brothers band. Well, there's a lot of great players that the, who could have taken those roles, so a lot of great guys with chops and women, but 
How do you choose a band like that? Like, what are the what are the things you're looking for aside from talent? Well, you know, John Belushi and I put that band together one musician at a time, very similar to what Danny ended up writing the movie about, going to each guy and hiring them one at a time. And we didn't exactly know what the act was going to be, except it was going to be blues. Mm -hmm. Originally, it was going to be straight Chicago-style blues uh, and Muddy, Muddy Waters-style, John yeah. Lee Hooker. Uh, and then it, it developed into a more of a blues R&B soul thing. But initially, mm -hmm. we were putting together the hottest blues band we could, and everybody wanted to do it. We had a choice of anybody. Mm -hmm. The great Mike Bloomfield, I remember, wrote a multi-page letter to Belushi, which he showed me, how much he wanted to play. And Belushi said, no. I think maybe he didn't want to be upstaged by him. Whatever it was, I mean, he had some reputation. Bloomfield, you yeah, know, of course. listen to him now, my God. The, those, those songs are so powerful, that movie is so powerful, and now it's completely common for an SNL cast to have a movie based on a character from that show, but yeah, the Blues so Brothers true, was it? the first. Yes, that's right. Right? And I mean, it speaks to the whole, the band, it speaks to what you did, Belushi and of course, Ackroyd together. You know, that thing that they At had. At the time, I didn't realize that, you know, that it was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I only, when I started to see all the tribute acts and the clone, Blues Brothers clone acts, yeah. and when I watched them do it and I said, you know, this, this wasn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Absolutely. Anyway, everybody wanted to do this. We could have had our pick of anybody. And the first guy we hired was Steve Jordan, who mm -hmm. was playing in the SNL band at the time. Both Belushi yeah. and I agreed you couldn't do better than that on drums. Yeah. And then one by one, uh, I remember that a lead guitar player was very important to him because yeah. he thought of himself as Jagger, you know, and yeah. he needed a Keith. Um, and I said, you know, let, this is key. John, don't, you know, yeah. don't hire just anybody. And he, he, was, he wanted to get somebody in that, in that spot. But there was this one night where he was very frustrated. A guy came over to kind of audition. And John was ready to sign him up. And I said, John, just wait. And I think, you know. And he was so frustrated. And he says, we got to go see Doc. Doc? I said, what are you talking about? Doc Palmas, the great mm -hmm. old... Songwriter wrote Save the Last Dance for Me. Belushi and he had become friends in the, in the late night world in which he inhabited. And Doc was out every night seeing new talent. He was a wheelchair bound older guy. And uh, we went to, we found him in a, in a club on an amateur night, explained the problem. He says, Well, you want Matt Murphy. Yeah. And I, I must confess, I didn't know the name, yeah. but Doc explained to me who he was and what his credits were. He had played with uh, everybody on the on the Chicago scene, you know? Um, and I said, okay, you know, we can hire him. I said, but we gotta have a rhythm guitar player too. Cause I just, you know, if he's that kind of legit blues player, I said, well, you know, often these guys are not quarterly uh, yeah. so comfortable, you know, let, we, we gotta have a second. Okay, that was our deal. And then Tom Malone, who, our, our great trombonist, who's played with me all through Letterman too. Uh, he said, you know, Steve Cropper and Duck Dunn are Available and these are of course the stars from Booker T and the MGs yeah, the who played, made all of the Otis Redding records and the Sam and Dave records and stuff. And when they joined, I said, "Well, I can't believe it," you know. Uh, but when they joined, that's when things kicked into gear. And they said, "We can't just do all blues. We got to have some hits." Yeah. And they said, "Let's do Soul Man." And it was it was they who who suggested that we cut Soul Man again. The the Cropper and Dunn and all those yes, things? Yes, yeah. yes, and, they, they, and, and Tom Belushi how to sing it. That's amazing. Yes, I remember so, so clearly them, him going over with them and them trying to stress him. You know, well, if he thought himself a Jaguar. I was educated <laughs> from good stock. <laughs> now Did, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure that it didn't even say it. I was educated at Woodstock. Yeah, that's right. You know, people used to say that maybe that was you as your lyric. Oh, it's, it's all so convoluted. I was with Steve Cropper not, not too long ago. Right. I think he was pulling my leg. He said, no, the lyric is Woodstock. That is the lyric. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, could, well, he, if, if Belushi saw himself as Jagger, he ended up getting Keith's later drummer, right? Jordan became really close with, with yeah, Keith, and that, of course. Yeah, that's true. Well, you know, I think the, their, their friendship was probably forged around that time because I remember when we were doing the record, first Blues Brothers record, recording live in L.A. at the Universal Amphitheater, nine shows, and then editing them all together. And Keith came 
And that may have been where they met. And I remember uh, Keith and Belushi sitting together one night, and Belushi saying, well, you got a jazz drummer. He felt uh, uh, that uh, Jordan was a jazz drummer. Of course, he could, Jordan could play anything. Absolutely. Uh, but those guys forged, forged the bond at that time. Are you, do you still listen to lots of music, like new music? Are you, like, or do you... Uh, I can't say that I yeah. keep up like I used to. Yeah. I have to admit that this music isn't necessarily made for me right. anymore. You know, music is for kids, pop music. Right. I can still appreciate it, but I don't. It was always for kids, though, wasn't it? Wasn't pop music always Absolutely for kids? Absolutely it yeah. was. Frank Sinatra was a Bobby Sox teenage idol. That's right. That's where you're most susceptible when you are a teenager and you're first, you know, first starting to notice girls and stuff. When you think about Beethoven's Ninth, you think about the great paintings, uh, either Picasso or, or, uh, or um, uh, uh, Da Vinci would have done, the great designs he would have come up with, of course, in Van Gogh, the, the concept of old lions. So just because the music is for youth and, and they, are, they drive the purchasing power, it's now at your age and at guys with your experience, you know so much more, you can do so much more. So do you still have the ideas could still come you know, pouring through your head? Do you still sit at the piano or the organ and try to, the stuff you do for, for Letterman's new show, do you, do you still feel like you have so much more to I give? I think I've, uh, in my maturity, if I may put it that way, I think I've learned to just sort of let, let God write the stuff. I think maybe that's what the real songwriters do. Yeah. And I don't know, I look at that picture on the Letterman show, and I just, you know, see what comes into my mind, and I'll just start to... Yeah, yeah, that could, yeah, and, you know, just put, put it together that way. Uh, I think God really writs all the songs. Really? Yeah. And you said We're there. a conduit. We have to reopen and just let it, let it flow through us. Do you have to pray to her or him every single night to say, can you give it to me again tomorrow? Well, I do, I do pray. Yeah? Absolutely do. I don't pray for, you know, give me yeah. a hit song, <laughs> no, you know. I think God's got other things to do than to program the billboard charts. What did Waits say? God's yeah. away on business? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, so you're a spiritual person. Have you always been? Spiritual? Yeah. I don't know. Yes, I think I have. Yeah. Um, certainly, uh, you know, brought up in that um, town of Thunder Bay. Not, not many Jews up there, but um, there was only one synagogue, and it was an Orthodox right. synagogue. So my, although my parents were barely observant, my, my, I had this Orthodox education, so I, I'm, I'm pretty well versed in it. And then, uh, speaking of spirituality, and I was telling you about how depressed I was in first year, and then I stayed in Toronto over the summer mm -hmm. and played in the, yeah, in, the, in the topless bars of Young Street and stuff. Uh, and then I met this guy uh, com coming home from an all-nighter, 6 a.m., walking through Yorkville, and a guy sitting on a stoop playing guitar, and I walked right by, and then I heard what he was doing, and I came right back, and I zeroed in on him, and he was like, Coltrane on the guitar. Talk about spiritualism. Right. I, I had this sense that this guy was communicating with the Almighty right, right. there on the, on the steps of the grab bag in, in Yorkville. And I said, how do you do that? What, what are you doing? And, and right then he said, well, do you have a piano? I'll go show you some stuff. And now it's 8 a.m. and he's showing me some things. And this guy's name was Munoz. Mm -hmm. And I still play with him, and he really is a, a spiritual guru. You still play with Munoz? I, yes, he moved wow. back to, he was an American who moved back to New York, and uh, we just did a session the other day, a kind of an all-star session, with Billy Hart, the great jazz drummer, and Dave Liebman. So that, that Yorkville scene, you would have crossed paths with a ton of people. Like Neil would have been kicking around, Joni kicking well, around. Well, just, uh, I was just a little later than that. Yeah. You know, I got to U of T, 68, I think, end okay. of 68. So, so, yeah, they were already gone uh, and on yeah. to uh, the, uh, the U.S. Was there Spectre still there? Did it loom large? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of Neil Young, uh, um, he came, as you know, from Winnipeg, yeah. Manitoba. And it says right in his book where he was ready to leave home and go, you know, and try to become a, a, a musician. The next town over was Thunder Bay. Well, at that time it was called Fort William. Yeah. And Port Arthur and Neil Young, with his first band, the Squires, a, tri a trio from from uh, Winnipeg, mm -hmm. were stranded in Thunder Bay for several seasons. I was a little too young to go out. Right at that time, fourteen or fifteen. But they were there. They were there, and by the time I did go out and got into a band myself, uh, we were playing all of his arrangements. 
Neil Young. I don't think mm. he was writing much yet, but he was doing a thing where he would take old folk songs and rearrange them and change the melodies and rock them up. Mm -hmm. And so these were the songs, when I started playing, we were still playing his, his type of arrangement. One, he did Oh Susanna rock arrangement, which went like this. Mm -hmm. And you go, well I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. And that was one of the first, you know, this was a Neil Young yeah. arrangement. So I never met him, but you know, his, his, uh, his influence was felt. Even no by kidding. Me. That's yeah. pretty rad. And then another one, High Flying Bird, he used yeah. to do. When you um, started to get profile and fame, how did you handle it? Were you good with it? When I did what? When you started to get profile and fame and people started to recognize oh, you. Oh, oh, uh, my wife hated it. Yeah? I don't know why. I felt like it was an invasion of privacy or something. To me, it was like I, I can pay the bills. Maybe I can ma make a go of this. You know, that's all it meant to me. But it's very flattering when people, especially right. if they're nice. Uh, that can be challenging at home. What's though. wrong with that, though? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, a little bit at home. I, I, family time is supposed to be family time. Right. Well, the other day, uh, and I, I'm not. You know, I, I appreciate any any opportunity to take a selfie with anybody. Yeah. I'm I'm thrilled to do it. But we were at a restaurant. Uh, another couple. Dining, you know, conversation, and people come over. You take a selfie. Yeah, absolutely, my pleasure. And I took a selfie with, yeah. with a young gal, and she said, "Now will you do a video for my friend?" <laughs> and well, I got it. You know, I, yeah. I had to apologize. Yeah, I have people here. <laughs> people are, yeah. <laughs> but it's all to me. It's all yeah. good, and it's just you know, part of show business. And I humbly will yeah. try to take uh, all the selfies I can. Right. So you make music for Letterman. What else are you doing? Well, uh, well I'm, I'm very excited about um, uh, uh, my first symphonic gig that I'm going to do <clears throat> next fall. Kalamazoo, Michigan, 80-piece orchestra. And I'm going to get them rocking. This gig came to me through Marvin Hamlish's widow. Mm -hmm. I got to know Marvin a little bit and, and his widow, Terry, uh, when Marvin was alive. And she called me up and said, you know, he used to work conduct a lot at the Kalamazoo Symphony, and I've recommended you to them now. And so I'm very excited about this. The arrangements are being written now by a guy in Belgium with whom I Skype and we yeah. talk about the charts. And I'm just going to do all my favorites that, that were ever a little bit orchestral, like Barry White and his Love Unlimited Orchestra. I'll be doing stuff like that with this 80-piece orchestra. That sounds like a lot of fun. I can hardly wait. It's a different kind of pressure. So I know the one thing about leaving a show, I mean, you had did it for a lot longer than I did, but you do have to try to figure out what to do with your time. But there's also this other part, which is when you have to make a schedule and you have lights and you have, you have a performance every night, there's, a, there's an energy you get to replace that, not that you need to, but I'm sure on a deep cellular level, you're like, fuck, I need something. Took me, I would say, two years to get over that feeling. Yeah. And now there's something good about not having that schedule. And just doing, you know, I used to do all these extra things at the same time as the show. And I look at pictures of myself and I always had huge bags under my I was exhausted all the time. Right. Now I, you know, now I feel great. And uh, the things uh, that I used to do, now I don't have to worry about, oh, at 4.30 I've got to go tape the show. Right. I can just worry about these other things and also uh, give my wife some of that uh, attention that she That's right. so, de so richly deserves. Well, you know, when my friends were athletes, when they retire and they go back to their home, their wives are like, can you go back to work? Or their husbands are like, can you go back to well, work? Well, of course. I don't want you around with your in your pajamas all day long. <laughs> go find a job. Did you ever, do not doze off, but doze off during, like, an interview or something during the show where you just weren't as focused? You were trying to do something else? And well, then yes. Or in the earlier days, absolutely. And Dave Letterman uncannily would know. Yeah. when I wasn't paying attention, because he'd be talking to the camera and all of a sudden, Paul, did someone give you the day off? You know, he would say things like, he could always, and so I learned, you know, eyes on the prize, don't take your eyes off. Right. And so if I had to program a, something on a little Moog synthesizer, you know, I'm going yeah. to do it like, you know, <laughs> never take your eye. I had to learn how to do that, because he would always catch me. It was almost perverse fun for him. Right, and he just also needs you to have his back in a way, so the two of you are in that together every well, single night. Well, it's true that I had to be there, whether musically or verbally, right. to support him. That was my job. And so when you see him in this, in this new stage, that must be really fun for you. 
Oh, yeah. Well, I think it's just really what he should be doing. You know, he did a thing right after we stopped Letterman. We had a number of dinners yeah. where we sat together and said, well, what are we going to do now? We, we were both of us kind of yeah. at, uh, at loose ends. And he, then he did a thing for the National Geographic, which had funny, it was humorous, but also kind of serious. He went to India and he mm -hmm. talked about world hunger and stuff. It showed how curious he was. Yeah. That's what that, I thought that Nat Geo thing did. Anyway, I think that it inspired him to do the kind of show that he's doing now for Netflix, where it's still entertaining, it's still funny, but they will cover some issues. Yeah. Anything that he's interested in, he, you know, he will cover it, have a guest in the studio, then go out and demonstrate out in the field and stuff. It's really interesting. I'm very happy to be doing a, a little bit on it yeah. myself, just playing my little piano music. So the symphony you're going to do in Kalamazoo, will this be your National Geographic thing or it'll spark something else in you? Well, I mean, I, I would love to do some more dates like that. Yeah. Imagine what 80 guys playing Love's theme yeah. is going to be like. Are you kidding? Fantastic. Uh, I get so excited about it yeah. that, yes, I mean, I hope that it's successful and I get to do it again. Right. Nothing more than that. Songs with the with a symphony, and I'll tell stories in between, as I did, you know, when I did my little tour last spring with my band, yeah. and uh, I know I did. I did Las Vegas. I was right back in the Las Vegas lounge over Christmas, New Year's, doing that lounge performing. That I was. I might as well have been back at the Brass Rail on, <laughs> on Young Street, you know. But who are some of the legends you played with that you still kind of are stay close to your heart? Well, James Brown. Yeah. First time he did the show. In 82, I'll never forget it. It was so heavy, and he just brought two horns and played with my little four-piece band. And then he did it many times after that, and every time was like a music lesson. Mm -hmm. Although he had no musical training, he had no terminology right. with which to explain to his musicians what he wanted, but he would get it across anyway. Just singing it, and, uh, like grunting and stuff. Do that thing, do that yeah, thing that you do. And they'd, they'd figure out how to do what he wanted. Just watching that was, you know, a million dollar right. education. What's your last memory of um, Gilda? What about Gilda? What's your last memory of her? What do you remember oh, from her? Oh my goodness. Whew. You know, there's a new documentary mm -hmm. that just came out on her called Love Gilda. Yeah. That's really so uh, nostalgic and has a lot of the songs that she and I wrote together. Uh, when she was on Broadway, mm -hmm. uh, we wrote a bunch of it was like a music. She was singing, mm -hmm. dancing, everything. And most of the songs we wrote together, mm -hmm. and they all came back in this uh, documentary. It's it's quite nostalgic, right. and her she, her legacy she lives on. You know, saw Tina Fey on the yeah. on Dave's show yeah. recently, and I couldn't help but saying, "Boy, she's very Gilda esque in this." Yeah. And they even have a number. They have Amy Poehler and some of the. The newer people from SNL reading Gilda's journals in the thing and commenting on them and talking about how she influenced them. She's quite influential, especially for females. For sure. In comedy. There weren't many of them at that time. There's way more now. But she was right up there with Lucille Ball. And you got to create some such great stuff with her. Like those friendship moments. Well, you really know powerful. that we met here in Toronto. Mm -hmm. She was from Detroit originally, but had been here. I think she followed a boyfriend up to Canada, and we were in that classic uh, 1972 Godspell. Company of Godspell, the Canadian company. Besides Gilda, the, uh, all the kids that became the SCTV, Andrea Martin, mm -hmm. and uh, Martin Short, and Eugene Levy, and all of them, and not SCTV, but Victor Garber, yeah. you know, who was great in actor. Titanic and everything. Yeah, what well, a great singer, too. Yeah. So Gilda and I, fast friends, then we both moved to New York right around the same time, and we both got hired on SNL at the same time. Mm -hmm. Me as a pianist in the band and her as a star. <clears throat> but she, um, man, I had to get a visa every time I got a new job. I'd have to get a new visa from the you know, yeah. Department of Immigration. And I remember her typing out my green card application, because I was just, I don't know how to type. Gilda, what am I going to do? <laughs> give me that. Just give me that. Give me that. What is, you know, typing in, you know. That's amazing. Yeah, we, we had a close friendship. Do you, are you a, re a reflective kind of person? Do you think back on the things you've been a part of? Sometimes, if I have a minute, yes. And I, some of these great musical experiences, I don't, I'm working so hard at the time that I don't realize how amazing they are until later. And I can look back and say, oh my God, that happened too. 
Oh my, that was hilarious, wow. I and mean, we've talked this whole time and we haven't even mentioned Spinal Tap, which is still one of the greatest comedies oh, well, ever made. Oh, well, thank you, as, as they used to say, thanks for remembering. Fun, <laughs> fun to have a little bit part in that movie, Spinal Tap, yeah. which was made in about, yes, 82 or yeah. 83, and still has legs. People still talking about it. People still think it's real, depending on who you ask. Like, it's so wild. Some of the performers say it's not funny. It's so real, I don't, it's not funny. <laughs> I was lost in Cleveland backstage. So many people yeah. say, I got lost in the backstage at Cleveland, and now I gotta watch it on TV. That's not funny. Well, and there are record reps like Artie Fufkin, like th those guys existed. Well, right? I based it, um, you know, we all made up our own lines. There was no lines written for that. The kick my ass was your line? Well, they told me the story. Um, this scene with Kick My Ass was based on a real story. A couple of them had been in a comedy group called The Credibility Gap, and they made records, yeah. and they were on a promotional tour, and they went to a music store, and nobody came for the, for the signing, and the, and the guy said, Kick My Ass, you know, the promo man, self-flagellating, said, it's all my fault, Kick My Ass. Yeah. So that's what we were going for. Right. But as far as how to get there, that's it fun. was all our own, you know, and I remember Harry, Harry Shearer got me, got me in it, uh, sold me to the rest of them. This guy right. will be funny as the promo man, and called me about it, and oh, I was thrilled. And I said, so will I be getting uh, my lines in advance? He says, you'll be making them up, sir. <laughs> and he wasn't kidding. We, you know, we were making them up and saying them, and people were hearing them for the first time in the scenes, and laughing and breaking up. Right. And Rob Reiner, the director, would say, no, it's fine, you know, you would laugh if somebody <laughs> said, let's go again, leave that in, you know, leave that out, let's just go again, and that's how they did it. Well, he was new too, Rob Reiner. Right? First, it was yeah. his first production, yeah. You know. So well, they all say now that he would have been one of the band members in the, in the thing, because they all wrote it together too, Right. Uh, but he couldn't fit into the spandex pants. That's why he became the director. <laughs> Do you play at home at night? Do you play piano? Still? Yes, yeah. yes, I do. Yeah. Does it still bring you a kind of joy and peace? Yes, absolutely does. Um, during Letterman, I didn't play much at home. I was kind of saving it for the year. But now I'm, yeah. you know, I kind of have the space to be able to play a little bit. And I'm still playing, you know, the songs from my youth and yeah. just stuff that I like. What is, what's your wife's favorite song to sit and watch you play? Um, she loved the Dave Clark Five, like I did. You know, yeah. that's how old we are. And they had a beautiful ballad because mm -hmm. uh, that we always used to say that's our song, nice. you know. Uh, so she likes that one, and um, she if she knows what's good for her, she likes everything I do. <laughs> really, she likes nothing, none of it, none of it. So great to see you. It's a pleasure. Thanks for taking the time. Let me play a song. What do you want to hear? Whatever you want. Something from my era, Blues Brothers era. Something, say, something blues. Something that's got a, like a, a nice arm. Bluesy. Blue. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank Strombo. you. Strombo. Strombo. That works. Yes, indeed. Strom works too. Thanks for having me. Dude, you're always welcome. Thank you. That's great.